Um, I'd like to introduce you to Craig Wilkins, who is the Chief Executive of the state's peak environmental body, the Conservation Council of South Australia. Craig's worked in the areas of public health, social services, environmental change and politics for the last 25 years in a variety of not-for-profit and government organisations as well as in Parliament House. Craig's a passionate believer in collective altruism, the act of people generously working together on behalf of others and on behalf of the planet that we call home. Please welcome Craig Wilkins. Uh, thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity. I too would like to acknowledge the Ghana people whose lands we meet on today. Um, as you probably gathered by now, the issue of nuclear is deeply dividing and polarising. Um, there are zealots on both sides, hardly anyone is neutral, and that includes members of the Royal Commission. And much of the Royal Commission's report has been deeply contested by experts. Um, so I'd like you to, to, to suggest that uh, that report is one view, but not the complete story. I must admit, I, I wasn't sure how I felt about nuclear uh, when the Royal Commission was announced. Um, I had a range of feelings and I, so I deliberately went out and spoke to prominent environmentalists in South Australia who supported nuclear power to find out more. And what I learnt after those conversations and lots and lots of other work and research over the last 18 months, I'm, I'm not, it hasn't convinced me that this is the path for our future prosperity. I believe it lies elsewhere. So let's drill down into your role as members of the Citizens Jury and thank you so much for taking on this important task. Um, I can tell you what, certainly what, what it's not about. It's not about a debate around the merits of nuclear power in South Australia. Uh, this will never happen because of the amazing growth of renewable energy, even with carbon pricing. Uh, we are a world leader in renewable energy that will only increase and nuclear power will never be a natural fit for that. So you can leave that to one side. Secondly, this is not about the safe storage of waste from medical purposes or the importance of x-rays or how, how lovely x-rays are and I mean, I've, I've benefited from them, I like them too. Um, this is not about that and about how, how important they are because there is a, a separate uh, specific federal government process to deal with that low level radioactive waste. What you're being asked to consider, and what really is in contest, is a very specific proposal to make money by importing high-level nuclear waste into a part of the world that doesn't actually have it, and by doing so, turn South Australia into the world's largest nuclear waste site. The devils are very much in the detail. I think most people think that this is about uh, burying waste deep um, underground, in the outback somewhere, out of sight, out of mind but there is a lot more to it than that. Even before that, uh, the waste has to come in on, on ships. Uh, about once every three to four weeks, every 24 to 30 days, for 70 years. That's the volumes we're talking about. Those ships will be coming through our waters, through our prawn fisheries and our tuna fisheries and our other aquaculture for 70 years. The waste will be unloaded onto a specific purpose-built port somewhere on the South Australian coast they don't say where, it could be you know, south of Wyala, somewhere like that. Let me just, um, just click on. So somewhere on the South Australian coast, in a beautiful coastline, there'll be a purpose-built port. Then the waste is transferred to a separate facility around five kilometres, ten kilometres from the coastline, where it will stay there for decades. They are talking about up to 60,000 tonnes of high-level nuclear waste sitting above ground for around 80 years. This is not out of sight, out of mind. Um, this is a very prominent feature of our landscape which we are taking on. And Greg Ward from the Royal Commission was very candid yesterday when he said that, that they'll be taking on about 50,000 tonnes of high-level nuclear waste over the first 17 years of this, of this project, even before the underground facility is being built. It is built. And why? 
you know, why would you take on that risk first? Surely you'd, you want to try and make sure it works first before you actually start importing the waste. And the reason is the business case collapses unless they do that level of, of risk transference first. So let's talk about the economics. There is no market currently for international high-level nuclear waste. It's never been transferred from one country to another with all its risks. So to work out what a, a, a price a country will, will pay is essentially guesswork. It's assumptions and modelling. And so it is quite remarkable that the Royal Commission has chosen just one source of information for that modelling, one consultancy firm, to come up with such an important part of this whole conversation. Because if the business case doesn't stack up, then why are we doing this? I've used one consultancy firm with known ties to the nuclear industry, with some, perhaps some vested interests involved as well. So I'd really like to question some, some of those, that economic modelling behind the choices we're making. And then on, on, on the cost side, um, this is an industry which is, um, <laughs> it has a, a remarkable history of, of, of cost overruns. Um, let's see if it works. Here we are. So that's a picture of the Clinton nuclear power plant in the US. That uh, went 10 times over budget, 1,000% over, and two to three time cost overruns are very common in the nuclear industry, including in Finland and Europe and, and other places. This is part of the whole economics of nuclear um, all around the world. I mean, economists don't even know what interest rates will be in three months' time, let alone what the price for nuclear waste will be in 70 years. Uh, there's so much guesswork in, involved. So lots of blowouts. And then there's the issue of, of, um, of, of, of competition. There's an assumption in, in the economic modelling that somehow we make a mozza, but no one else jumps in and actually makes a mozza as well and tries to compete with us and lower the price. There's an assumption we have a premium price that goes on forever for the next 50 to 70 years. And what about insurance? That we actually... Uh, no insurance company will take this on. The risk will be taken on by you and me. Uh, and if you doubt that, go home and check out your household insurance policy. And there is a, actually a specific disclaimer around nuclear. Uh, that, that's the standard because no, no insurance company ever takes this on. So, and it feels to me like there is this kind of narrative that we, we are get sucked into in South Australia. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, of somehow this magic economic miracle which comes from overseas. Anyone remember the multifunction polis in, in, in the 80s? Similar sort of kind of energy around that. If it's such a good deal, if we are going to make such amount of money that, that people are talking about, then why haven't other countries done it? Or why aren't they rushing to do it? Something just doesn't add up. Either the revenue just isn't there, or the costs and risks and safety issues are so much greater. And so let me jump into those. Um, the safety issues, I'm not sure about you, but I'm, I'm horrified by the idea of turning parts of our coastline into essentially a sacrifice zone for that amount of time. The truth is no one knows if we can do this safely. Not one country has worked out how to store high-level nuclear waste safely for the length of time it remains dangerous to humans. You often hear about the Finland site. They are still building it. It won't take waste until the next decade. Um, and yet, even before it's complete, um, we're talking about taking on 20 times the volume that the Finns are, are planning to take without even checking to see if it works first. The only real-life experience of deep underground waste facility of nuclear waste anywhere in the world is the waste isolation pilot plant uh, in New Mexico and the US. This, this was supposed to be the best, the safest, the most advanced in the world. In 2014, after just 15 years of operation, there was a fire, unrelated rupture of a barrel, systems failures, workers being exposed. It was closed. It's still closed. And they, they reckon the cost will be about half a billion dollars to clean that up. That's the only real life experience. So quickly, just uh, I'm down in my last two minutes, but quickly with, with, with the ethics. You often heard the argument about somehow because we export the uranium, we are duty-bound to then import high-level nuclear waste. The international law is very clear. The responsibility lies in the countries that produce the waste. And equally, I think a bigger responsibility lies with the companies that have actually profited from this industry for many, many years. Um, 
they're, they're members of the World Nuclear Association, and they take on a cradle to, to, to grave management of this stuff. So why don't they turn some of their profits into finding a real waste solution, rather than putting the responsibility back on, on us, on, on you and me. And we're not the only country with a, with a right geology, there are lots of others. And can I please put to bed this crazy argument that somehow we will have this sort of stable political space in terms of the length of time. If they talk about it being, um, you know, just, just for the last sort of 80 years, 100 years of, of parliamentary democracy, let's go back. Australia beginning with, with you know, Captain Cook in terms of white Australia. We go further. Magna Carta about 600 years ago. We go further back from that, eventually, <laughs> if these slides work. Uh, okay, pyramids, 4,000 years. Mammoth, 10,000 years. Back to Neanderthal era. That's the kind of length of time we're talking in terms of whole of life cycle responsibility that we are taking on on behalf of ourselves and on behalf of future generations. So let me just finish. There are probably three, three things I'd like to really like you to remember in terms of those principles of what you should consider. Firstly, there's a, um, a real fatal flaw in this whole issue of economics versus safety. Because we can have the rolled gold standard safe option around, around this, but it's going to uh, come at a cost. So we can either have that real safe option or we can make profits. We can't have both. That's the first point. So I'd really ask you to, to, to question deeply the economics behind this. Secondly, which part of our South Australian coastline is going to be the sacrifice zone for this? Um, then we need to know the location before we proceed because all the, the environmental issues, sorry, I'll be, 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 one minute. Um, all the environmental issues around um, water and, and, um, and, and, and community concerns and, uh, will only be known once we actually find the location. And then lastly, about wh why the rush? Why we, like, like this stuff lasts for generations. We've been given a few months to decide. And ultimately, I think we can do better. So I would actually encourage you to consider actually, rather than going through the gate, actually pausing, stopping and closing the gate for a while. The waste will still be here in 10 years' time. Let's perhaps consider it then, but not now.